So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, very early this morning. Uh, my name is Bhushan Gopalani. I'm a professor at uh, the University of British Columbia. I'm chairing this session along with uh, Professor Suresha of uh, University of uh, Alberta. Uh, Alf asked me not to read through his entire biography, but I think that's the fun part of this presentation. So <laughs> I'm going to read a few things from his biography. So it's, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Dr. Alf Isaacson. Uh, he received an MSc in computer engineering and a PhD in automatic control, both from Ling Chopeng University in Sweden. Uh, he then continued uh, at the same university as an assistant professor uh, until 1992. He spent a sabbatical year at the University of Newcastle in Australia, and starting 1992, uh, he has been a professor at the Royal Institute of Technology, also in Sweden. Uh, he has some connection with the University of British Columbia, where I come from. He spent a few months there at the Pulp and Paper Center as a visiting professor. And since uh, 2001, he has, been a, um, he has been at the corporate office of ABB in Sweden. He's been at the forefront of uh, the Industry 4.0 revolution. Um, I happened to have a conversation with him about a couple of years ago at uh, the IFAC World Congress, and I would put him in the category of those who are pragmatically optimistic about uh, autonomous plants. Um, and finally, he doesn't know this. Uh, I actually, I just mentioned this to him right before this, uh, uh, before talking to you. Uh, but he had a major influence on my own career. Uh, he was one of the very first people in engineering to recognize the connection between what is called expectation maximization algorithm and system identification. He wrote his uh, first paper on this topic in 1992. Uh, I accidentally discovered that and I ended up writing many papers on that very topic. So thank you for introducing expectation maximization algorithm to the engineering community. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Alf Isaacson, our plenary speaker this morning. Thank you very much, Bhushan, for those nice words. Um, so can we put the slides on, please? Right, uh, so the title that we agreed on, which is quite a while ago by now, uh, was The Autonomous Industrial Plant, Future of Process Engineering Operations and Maintenance. I could have put a question mark at the end, because really what I'm here to discuss is, is autonomous plants and, uh, and the notion of autonomy something that we can adopt into the, the process community as well. Uh, before coming to the outline, just a, a couple of observations. I mean, things are happening pretty fast these days. And I think it's uh, quite an exciting time to be active in, in our area and in, in science and engineering in general. And we have power with the shift to uh, renewables and, and uh, I mean, Internet of Things. Uh, and. Uh, in industry 4.0, whatever you call it, uh, lots of uh, new applications for robots, humans working with robots also for production, uh, and uh, smart cities we heard about uh, already in, in this conference, and uh, n not the least uh, how we move uh, with electrical vehicles coming into uh, the picture much more, right? even electrical aviation. Uh, and the key challenge for industry will really be to kind of decouple the fact that we need to become environmentally friendly and that we need to increase productivity. I would claim that it's kind of a myth that there is a contradiction between those two. But it's not obvious that you can do that decoupling. Right? But you can increase productivity while reducing uh, CO2 emissions, for example. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, this next uh, 45, 50 minutes or so is, uh, well, I'll bore you with some facts about the company I work for. Um, and then I will talk about uh, a few trends and what we see, and I've actually talked at some other 
occasions uh, like CPC a couple of years ago about the future of automation and, and all that. Uh, but of course, the main topic of the day is uh, AI and aut the transition into autonomous systems. So um, you might, I mean, if you follow media, and uh, particularly if you're from Europe, uh, uh, even more in particular if you would be from Sweden or Switzerland, uh, or but even Germany, I mean, uh, uh, you would have noticed that uh, there are happening some big things with our company. We are divesting the high voltage, the power grids division to Hitachi. And then ABB today is uh, some 150, close to 150,000 people. Uh, the new uh, ABB, when this deal is closed, which will actually take until mid next year, so uh, these things don't go that fast. Um, will be 110,000 people, roughly. Quite well balanced between uh, the three regions where we're active, uh, Asia, um, Middle East and Africa, Americas and, and Europe. Uh, I, of course, work in research and development. And R&D in ABB today is roughly 9,500 people. But, uh, and, and in 10 major countries. There are some R&D locations in other countries, but you could say that it's focused on, on these 10 countries here. Uh, corporate research is a much smaller organization, a uh, little less than 10% of, of all of the R&D and in seven of, the, of those countries where um, I'm located at the Swedish office. But I've, I mean, in recent years, I worked globally uh, responsible for the control research. Right? At, at all the seven centers. So to, to just come back to a uh, similar uh, picture as before, we have the energy revolution, we have the industry revolution, and we have a great shift in, in uh, uh, e-mobility as well, and not just uh, cars. Uh, and that fits well with uh, the, the three markets that we serve from ABB, which is utilities, industry, and, and transport and infrastructure. I mean, people that know a little bit about ABB probably knew that we are in power and automation. It might be less known that we are actually having quite a, a sizable activity when it comes to transport and, and home automation. And we'll come back to some of that later on. Uh, and for the digital solutions, we have a, a brand ABB Ability, which is actually covering two things, because it covers the uh, the uh, it's it's sort of a collective name of the digital solutions that we have, but it's also a platform, which is built upon Microsoft Azure. So. Uh, when we talk about uh, cloud computing later for ABB, that would be in the ABB Ability Platform. Okay, future of automation. Um, well, I mean, we have all these buzzwords. You can add uh, AI and, uh, and uh, autonomy, if you like. I usually show this slide up front to just emphasize that we are a company that sell to other companies. Or we're in business to business. We are not a consumer company. Well, that's not entirely true because in the home automation, we, we sell to, and, and electrical vehicle charging, we might sell to, etc. But by and large, we sell to other companies. And sorry to say, just because there is a new version of the control system out it does not mean that they bring out the sleeping bags and, and stay overnight to get the new version the next day, right? When you release a new iPhone. Uh, so, sorry. Our, our customers want the same things today with the digital revolution as they wanted before. They want the safety, the lower cost, the simplified operations, production efficiency, better utilization of their assets. And I mean, at the end of the day, they, they want to make better and more informed decisions. So we always have to look at the business case and the value proposition of what we deliver. And, and it's important to bear that in mind. Um, 
what does an automation system look like today? Well, this happens to be uh, a sketch of the ABB 800XA system. But basically all um, control systems have a similar structure, uh, be it uh, Honeywell or Siemens or Yokogawa. Uh, and you have, you have the devices down below and, and then you connect them typically with wired communication into uh, a marshalling room where you have these controllers uh, and, uh, and then you have screens for operators, for, for the, the, the uh, maintenance engineers, etc. There are some uh, indications here in this that, that you have wireless and that you have connections to enterprise systems like SAP. But, and uh, most systems today are Windows-based and have been for a number of years. Uh, if you go back to the 80s, it was more proprietary and, and uh, oftentimes uh, operating systems developed by the vendors, right? But you could say that the structure we have is, looks pretty much the same as it did in 1983 when uh, ASEA Master was released. Uh, and we often also, oops, what's happening? It's living its own life. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so quite often we talk about uh, this automation hierarchy, both sort of as a mental picture, but actually also structure the system according to that. And what is happening? Well, you could say that it's not uh, too brave to predict that, uh, I mean, we're already seeing the, that some of these functions in the upper layers can move into the cloud, especially if the timing requirement is not that high. You, you don't have to do that in a server on premise, right? And Okay. Um, right. So, uh, ExxonMobil being one of the bigger process uh, companies in the world, already three years ago. Okay. Yeah, here we are, here is resetting. Yeah. Okay, um, they presented something that l doesn't look entirely like this. I've simplified it somewhat, but they say that a, a future architecture would be that you may have on-site cloud, global cloud, you have a common bus, and you have these devices down there that, that they call uh, distributed control nodes, but, but um, I mean, if you stretch it a bit further, you, we have so much intelligence in our instruments, in our pumps, valves, that you could, you could do a lot of the computation there in the future. And you don't necessarily need that middle layer with the controllers and, and the IOs. Right? Um, and in fact, we have similar solutions already today. This is one from, from ABB in, in Germany where they call it virtual power pool or virtual power plant, where you have a number of smaller producers, could be consumers of, of electricity, that are connected to a common optimization solution over internet. You send a set point to each one of them that you, you are allowed to produce this much, or you should produce this much in the next uh, time interval. And and uh, then you shift this, I mean, collection of smaller prosumers up and down like they were one power plant. And it has no uh, sort of uh, distributed control system. It's just a one, one unit, an RTU at each location, internet, and, and a common optimization solution. 
And, and again, to re repeat, I mean, our cloud solution would then be implemented uh, in this ABB ability based on Microsoft Asia. Okay, one other trend that we're seeing uh, is, of course, uh, you can't look at systems in isolation. Uh, you have production management, you have the process control, you have the electricity system, and you really have to take all of them into account. And I mean, that connection up there, we sometimes call demand response or industrial demand side management if it's an industry. Uh, and just as one example, we looked at mechanical pulp production. And there are two ways to produce uh, a pulp for, for paper production. You can either cook the, the wood chips in liquor, we call that chemical pulp, but you can, alternatively, you grind uh, the, uh, the wood chips uh, mixed with water in, in these big uh, thermomechanical pulp refiners. And you have typically uh, an ABB motor, actually ABB has a pretty large uh, share of that market, uh, of 25 megawatt. A refiner line is two refiners in series, so a refiner line is 50 megawatt. And you have a also, I mean, quite often you may have excess capacity in the pulp mill compared to, to uh, what you can produce in, in the, the paper machines that are next door in, uh, on the same location. Right? And then you have storage towers in between, so you can use them as energy storage if you like, uh, because you produce pulp when the electricity price is low, and you use the, the pulp from the storage tower when the electricity price is high. And we, we looked at how much can you save, and roughly, you can save uh, four to six percent of your electricity price. And given that the mill can have a uh, 200 megawatt uh, power consumption, that on, a, on an annual basis, that's not peanuts. Right? And uh, this was done for, the calculations were done for one mill in, in Finland. We did deliver to some other mills in the Nordic countries. Okay, uh, modeling. We will come back to modeling later on because modeling, I think, will be key moving forward. Uh, of course, the vision has always uh, been uh, to more or, less, more or less automate the modeling. If you have a CAD drawing of your plant, a PNI diagram, uh, and you have a library with modules for each one of these components for tank reactors, etc. Given that you have the topology information, you should be able to automatically produce a, a model in, for example, an object oriented modeling language like Modelica. Or other things, you should be able to produce the graphics uh, that you use in, in your control system, or some of the control logic, or interlockings, or whatever. Uh, this slide, well, it has survived, I think, uh, four generations of uh, PowerPoint templates in AVB because I, I created it uh, together with a colleague 2006 or something like that for uh, when I gave a keynote at uh, control systems for pulp and paper in Tampere in Finland. Uh, I think series might have been there. Um, but it's still the holy grail. And, but we are making some progress, finally. So we can now generate at least low-fidelity models. I mean, it all comes back to how well do you know the parameters of, of the different um, components. Right? And there you might still need to adjust that uh, fit parameters to data. But we have used to go directly from a PNI diagram to a model that we use for factory acceptance test for large oil and gas uh, deliveries. And that cuts down the time incredibly. We have done the same thing, and there it's actually, I would claim, simpler with mechanical things. Uh, uh, to one extent, depending on that, a number of the products, motors, robots, uh, 
drives might actually be ABB products, and we have good models for those. So we can put together a virtual production cell and make virtual commissioning uh, before you, you commission the real part. Uh, how do you train models? Uh, and if you need data, of course you can carry out experiments, but Christoph Fossman sitting there from, from Peristop, a uh, chemical company in Sweden, or globally, but head office in Sweden. Uh, Christa and I, together with uh, a couple of students, came up with a method to do data mining a few years ago. We have now implemented that, or colleagues of mine at, at ABB have implemented this in ABB ability. So if you store your operating data in a historian, you you can uh, screen the data for intervals where there is enough excitation to make a system identification. Typically based on, on uh, the data that we received from past half years ago, about 5% of data is actually useful. Most normal operating data don't have enough information to, to estimate any model. Right? But my thinking is, yeah, that's for temperature, pressure, that kind of numerical data. Can't you use similar thinking, screening information that you have stored for years for uh, alarm management, for uh, production scheduling, supply chain optimization, things further up in the, in the automation hierarchy? It wouldn't be exactly like we did it in, in that project, but I mean the same same idea, I think, leaves room for, for research. Because you don't necessarily want to wait for experiments. And sometimes making an experiment can trip the process. That was actually what kind of triggered us. Because they had an event that passed off where they needed to retune a controller. And in order to get data, they did an experiment. And that tripped the whole process. And we said, shouldn't you be able to use all the data that we have stored already? Um, and let's come back to modeling. Another trend is modular automation. So for things that are more flexible, where you have uh, smaller lot sizes, we see containerized production today. So when, when you want to have a shorter product uh, life cycle and you and you want to have a faster time to market, you can have a containerized modules that you put together. Then, of course, you should have modularized the automation as well. So you should have the automation ready for each container and then just put it together with, with some simple commands. And that's what we have been looking at uh, for the last few years. Uh, and it uh, applies to, I mean, industries like pharmaceutical industries, biotech, fine chemicals, food and beverage. Obviously not to, to bulk chemicals or a refinery that runs for, for years and years. Right? But maybe even here when you do a retrofit, if you have modularized your automation, you could use that, that concept. The project that we've been running has been, um, the major customer there has been Bayer, and, and uh, now we have another government-funded project with other, other customers like Merck and Evonik. Uh, the first demonstration of this technology was at the so-called Akema Fair in Frankfurt last year. We also showed it at Hannover Fair this year. Okay, so let's get into AI. What is AI? <laughs> yeah, good question. Uh, one definition uh, that uh, I kind of like, uh, but you could claim that it's uh, circular. It says that AI is when a machine does something that for a human would require intelligence. It still doesn't define what intelligence is, right? Uh, um, if you talk to people in, uh, in computer science active in artificial intelligence, they list a number of branches or topics within artificial intelligence. 
like natural language processing, for example, like learning probabilities that we might consider, isn't that statistics? Um, machine learning is one of them. So my m main takeaway here is machine learning is one part of AI. And deep learning, which is the big hype these days, is one part of machine learning. And there are a number of other areas, topics, that you would also consider artificial intelligence. And uh, of course, this is coming in to also to our reality. Uh, I mean, you, I would say not only yesterday, but today we are programming robots. We have, we, we have started looking at teaching robots, for example, what, what you call lead throw. You take the robot by the hand, by the tool, and you show what it should be doing, and it, it learns from that. But, of course, uh, using a camera and reinforcement learning, you can actually... I mean, have the robot learning itself how to grasp objects. This was a, a project uh, together with uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, we have continued to, to uh, work on this in-house as well. This is something that is very simple for us, incredibly difficult for a robot to understand that that plastic bottle over there is probably not very rigid, so I have to be a bit gentle when I lift it up. If I see that the, 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 the uh, cap is off, I sh probably shouldn't lift it like that, and, and things like that. It's, I mean, dead obvious to us, not, not obvious to, uh, to a robot. Um, Otherwise, when you hear about AI, um, I mean, of course, AI is used a lot by, by the internet companies, uh, I mean, Google, uh, Facebook, Amazon, etc. But you also hear uh, a lot in terms of games. In more than 20 years ago, uh, IBM uh, deeply beat uh, the, the world champion of uh, chess, but that was kind of rules and heuristics. In recent years, the the Go and, and this year, I don't know if you've heard about uh, Google DeepMind beat uh, a master player of StarCraft, which is really real time and lots of dimensions, right? Uh, but how do they do it? Well, basically by self-play. Play the game go or StarCraft millions of times and train AI, train deep learning or deep reinforcement learning to, to play the game. What can we learn from this? Well, I mean, obviously the complexity that they're able to handle is going up like crazy. Um, you could say life isn't playing a game uh, and we have unlimited states in reality. Or, uh, actually, the, the StarCraft there, the Alpha Star, that is getting up towards, uh, I mean, if you think of a big or reasonably big industrial plant with, uh, with states that you can shift different equipment, it's ballpark the same uh, dimension. So I don't think that is necessarily the biggest hurdle for us. The biggest hurdle is they have the game. They can play the game. Uh, it's well defined or it's available. If we want to do this in the virtual world and train AI, we need to develop a model first. But of course, for the, that robot application, if you have uh, a robot model and, and a, a good modeling tool you could potentially simulate grasping and, and train AI. I think the, the trick there would be how, how do you model the, sort of the, the softness of the object. Uh, but, but other than that, I mean, you, I mean, you can see that you, you can do it. But for an entire chemical plant, 
is it feasible that we would model to the level that where, where we can run this a million times and train AI? That we can discuss. Uh, but I do think that industrial AI needs a combination. And, uh, and already if, if AI is sort of machine learning diagnostics, you need domain know-how combined with the data science to, to really get somewhere. And if I look at one example uh, that we have worked with is um, this um, ASIPOD monitoring. The Asimuth thrusters from ABB is a, an electrical motor inside here. It looks like a torpedo sitting under a ship. So it's the propulsion of the ship with an electrical motor and propeller. And then you can, you can turn this around so you can direct the thrust in any direction. That's why you can park a, a large cruise vessel sideways. Right? Um, and um, what, when there is a problem with uh, an acipod, it's typically the bearing that, that uh, has a problem. And by monitoring the vibrations and looking at oil samples from the bearing, you can, of course, detect if it's starting to deteriorate. But we can do more today. We can actually predict uh, when it's going to fail. And even more so, we can do what we call prescriptive uh, analytics. We can say that if you, s if you run like now, it will, this is time here, it will fail here, which is before you reach the next port. If you slow down, a little bit or a little bit more, you re it won't fail until way after you've reached the next port. If you slow down even further, you have a, a dry docking planned, a maintenance stop planned, uh, and you will reach that. But we can only do this because we have lots of data. And why do we have lots of data? Because basically only ABB can service an ABB ACIPOD. So when an ACIPOD breaks, we, we know and we, we collect the data and the information. So we have lots of lifetime information. We can fit lifetime models for these acipods. And data is critical here. If, if you haven't started collecting data 10 years ago, if you start collecting data now, I mean, it will take a while before you have that information and you can do something like this. So, for us, machine learning is not new. We have been working with machine learning for 20 plus years. If you include, I mean, diagnostics uh, using uh, statistical methods in, in machine learning. Um, and here is a, is a slide that shows a number of, of, of different cases historically. We have worked a lot with uh, alarm management Actually, uh, one project together with uh, Bushan and, and uh, Sirish uh, a few years ago. Um, many of these projects or applications are still condition monitoring. They are diagnostics. Uh, they, they give a maintenance alert. More recent, and, and that goes for, I mean, the classical is rotating machines, uh, motor diagnostics. but. We have looked at predicting foaming in, in, um, uh, in uh, chemical plants together with BSF uh, in, in Germany. Uh, we have looked at uh, com uh, compressor monitoring, but we've also looked at, at that optimizing the compressor efficiency by having a, a machine learning map of, of the efficiency for different uh, operating points. Right? Uh, this is a cool one. Um, that is not the earth. That is the sky. So there, and that is a fish eye camera that looks up to the sky. So it's sitting in the middle of a solar park, looking at the sky. And we, we did a solution first, or the scientists at the Swiss Center did a solution that was based on more traditional methods and Kalma filters. But then we had collected a, an image every five six seconds for a year. So then, together with ETH Zurich, we uh, we uh, did it with deep learning and got 
slightly better results. So we can actually predict where the clouds are going to be within five minutes. And by that we can predict how much of the solar park is going to be shaded and by that how much power we'll get from we get. And then we can use that to control energy storage or to start up some other alternative uh, power source. So, and we need to get into these more operations related uses of machine learning and AI. Not just diagnostics is, is my opinion. One other thing that we have done uh, more recently is uh, to look, uh, I actually have a video here with the sound, uh, it's a rather long video, I'll spare you that one, but I think you get the picture. You can talk to the analytics solution. I mean, you, we have Siri and Alexa, uh, etc. So we, we, you may have tried to talk to your mobile phone, for example. You can do the same thing, but with a more tailored vocabulary for, for uh, monitoring an industrial plant. So it finds anomalies and, and then uh, you say, has this happened before? Well, let me see I'll, uh, if I can find a, a similar episode. Of course, it's kind of cool that you can talk to, to the application, but at the end of the day, what's really going to make the difference is the analytics underneath, right? It, it will not help you uh, uh, just talking to it if it gives uh, crap output in, in the anal analytics. But, but in certain circumstances, and customers we have showed it to you have, have been uh, quite excited. Uh, okay, so autonomous systems. I mean, we have had um, automation systems for more than 100 years. This is from the late 19th century. It's just a panel where you've collected so that you can maneuver the valves from one panel and you have the instruments, but there is really no automation as such. Then 1940s roughly, I think the second one is, and then we had the PID controllers and all that. Um, today's system we call collaborative because you have lots, uh, I mean we saw the connections to enterprise uh, uh, software, etc. You can in incorporate video uh, uh, and some then believe that the next step is that we go towards autonomous. And that is of course inspired by uh, the fact that we, we see autonomy in other applications. Uh, what do we mean by autonomy? Automation versus autonomy. Well, when I talk about autonomous, I think of something, I mean, like uh, if you talk about an autonomous country, it's a country that uh, supposedly makes its own decisions <laughs> about, the, uh, about what it's doing, right? And, and an autonomous system is something that can change its behavior, that can adapt to uh, something that at the time of programming was unforeseen. And we can potentially come back to, uh, to discuss what do we mean by unforeseen. Um, of course we see that, we, I mean, what we hear most about, I guess, is self-driving cars. But, uh, I mean, warehouse robots, uh, drones, uh, UAVs, uh, metros that are driverless. Of course you can say, how hard is that? Uh, it's on rails. Uh, and that kind of brings in the topic of levels of autonomy. Uh, and that's something that they have looked at quite seriously in the automotive industry. And there are standards out. This is from the Society of Automotive Engineers, so I think these days it's called SAE International, um, where they have defined the scale from zero to five. Zero being uh, the driver is in full control, five there you can sit in the back seat uh, reading your newspaper there is no driver um, and uh, everybody in the business i've been told uh, in, in automotive know what you mean when you say that something is at level two so a tesla car doing lane following locking on to the car in front of it keeping the car in the same lane that that is level two 
Uh, this is, of course, not new. I mean, people have studied in uh, more behavioral science as well uh, what, what impact does it have, what, what are humans good for, what are machines good for. Uh, that was already in the 50s. Right? Uh, level, ten levels of automation was published in 1978. A, a really seminal paper around in uh, year 2000 talked about different levels of autonomy for different tasks. It says information acquisition, information analysis, decision uh, selection and action implementation. And you could have different levels of automation for, for each one of them they say. And I think that's an important observation because when we go into to, uh, talking about autonomy, of course we compare with the autonomous driving, but industry is a bit more complex. Let's come to that in the next slide. So we have tried here now to make a very brief uh, uh, zero to five uh, definition that would apply to industry. But humans in complete control does not mean that we go 50 years back in time and remove all automatic feedback, right? It means that the operation is done by humans, but we still have uh, PID controllers or MPC controllers. And that's the tricky bit here. Can we assess where is a an oil refinery, would we say that, well, I mean, obviously you, you use a lot of manual uh, uh, intervention when you start it up, and, and if you have to stop, and if there is, a, I mean, an unplanned stop. But other than that, it goes with, uh, uh, with the operator mainly supervising the, the operation for, for years and years. Uh, so where is that? Uh, and is this useful for us to think in, in these terms? Uh, here's an ABB application again, mining, where um, we have had a, an EU project looking at uh, underground mining, and they, they created this video. For mining, there is a clear business case. First of all, it's safety, but it's actually productivity as well. Because uh, when you blast, which you do once or twice or three times per day, um, at a fixed time today, uh, you create these toxic gases. And you have to ventilate those out before you can go in with uh, drivers and, and vehicles. But if you would have electric, autonomous or remotely controlled vehicles, you could go in much faster and they have uh, radar and whatnot, they wouldn't be bothered about that there is a little bit of a mist from the, from the blasting, and that would be a tremendous increase of productivity. So here there is a business case, uh, and I think that's a, a key one. Um, but coming back to the comparison, our world, meaning uh, process uh, industry, for example, uh, and, and the uh, self-driving cars. The self-driving car is all, do you hear about the autonomous service of the car? No, you don't. Uh, so it's, it's all about the driving, right? Uh, but of course, if you want to, to uh, look at autonomy for a, an industrial plant, you have to see what is it that would save money for the company or increase safety uh, it might actually be in the engineering. We talked about the, the topology engineering going from CAD to model. Uh, it might be the, uh, the monitoring and diagnostics that we have been looking at, or it might be the operations. And that's where we have to look carefully. It's much more complex here because there are many more life cycle phases that we need to look at. And we have started to, I mean, this first definition that I had, uh, which was uh, very brief, actually, if you want to use it and really assess where a, a particular plant is at, you need something 
with a little bit more words and a little bit more crisp definition. It's uh, kind of boring to present uh, that because the, and I don't expect you to be able to read the details, but I mean you really need to go into detail and you need to separate between control room operation and, and field operation maintenance and planning and scheduling and other tasks. And you could be at different level of automation, similar to that uh, paper from 2000. Uh, so uh, just again to emphasize, you need to look at all phases like engineering, like operation. This is the one where we would save a lot of money from, uh, from ABB if we can cut down time on the, on the uh, actual construction, the engineering of the plant. Here is where uh, there is uh, potentially uh, a lot of value for, for the customer. And uh, uh, just to, to finish off with this and say the value proposition is key here. To just get rid of uh, two, three uh, operators in each shift, I don't think is enough uh, to, to justify starting to discussing uh, autonomy in, in industrial plants. There must be something more that we're after. So to conclude, uh, if we're going to look at autonomy for industrial plants, we need autonomy uh, along the entire life cycle. Um, the first applications are really for, for things that are moving. I mean, we have the self-driving cars, uh, etc. but for ABB that means mining vehicles, harbor cranes, uh, ships, uh, logistics robots, uh, things like that. And there, there is a clear customer pool already. In, in Norway, uh, they, uh, they want to have autonomous electric ferries across the fjords. So there are already uh, customer requests to ABB and other players in that market to deliver autonomous systems, right? autonomous docking of, of, of a ship or a ferry, for example. So there is, there is a business case. Is there a business case for an uh, autonomous uh, oil refinery? Yeah. Oh. Sorry, maybe I should have uh, made some more comments here. There are standards already. We are looking uh, in, in some areas like uh, driving. There is actually standards. There are standards emerging for shipping and we are looking, as we saw, at standards for other uh, ABB-related applications. AI and machine learning is one part, but it's not the only thing. And industrial AI will actually need, I, I claim, a combination of modeling and, uh, and more data-based methods. Right? But the value proposition is the key. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Alf, for a very stimulating talk on a, on a topic that is increasingly at play these days. We do have time for questions. Uh, questions from the floor. Please identify yourself and uh, Uh, thank you for the great talk. I really appreciate the perspective from industry. As a lot of people here are also from academia, educators, and the graduate students, I wonder from your industry's perspective, with the autonomous level increase, of course, we're going to need fewer people. And uh, so in the future, what type of the workforce would be needed? And uh, is it all in the high level? So what should our educators pay attention in terms of preparing the future workforce? Um, I think that at least for some time uh, we will have um, AI that supports the, the people. I don't think that the business case is in removing people necessarily. It, it, there, there are other pain points uh, for the companies uh, 
where we, we, where we can save money for the company. So, but of course, uh, there is an ever-increasing need for higher education for the people working in, in, in an industrial plant. Right? So, so uh, to, have, uh, to have a workforce, to have operators that are more I mean, aware of, uh, of digitalization, um, uh, etc., will, will of course, and, and, and I think that's going to be a, a shift in future. We talked about uh, that some people yesterday. Will, will people lose their jobs? Of course, some people will lose their jobs, but I think more importantly, you may have to, continuing education will be more important in the future. Because the change is more rapid, so what you trained for originally might not be valid during a, a whole 40-year career. So you, you might need to, to uh, do some courses or, or, or improve your knowledge. Right? But I, I don't, I mean, don't worry, people will not uh, immediately disappear. Uh, So your definition of autonomous systems as unforeseen events, and I'm, I'm wondering if it does have to have that, or if there's maybe there could be an intermediate level where there is extreme events, but yep. the really unforeseen events is what an operator would do, for instance. I'd, I'd like to have your thoughts. About yeah, that. Uh, very good question. We discussed that uh, internally uh, a couple of weeks ago. I said maybe you should say unusual events. <laughs> Because, uh, I mean, if you, if you compare with self-driving cars, it's not exactly unforeseen that somebody would cross the street, right? Uh, uh, but certain places and, and certain times, uh, it might be unusual that you have somebody popping up right there. And, and if you compare with AlphaGo, uh, what they did was not, of course, not unforeseen, because they played a number of games. But they saw situations that would come up in, in normal games very, uh, very seldomly, right? Actually, human experts that saw the, the Deep Mind AlphaGo play were amazed because it did moves that no human would ever consider. But of course, if you have seen a million games, uh, eventually you will find some clever move that nobody has ever thought of before. So I think that if you have a model and you're able to simulate, you can actually recreate unusual events and get a preparation for that, that you would not be able to do. I mean, if you do reinforcement learning on data, by definition, you will, ever see, you will never see, uh, be able to handle unforeseen events. You can only handle events that have actually already happened. Right, because you train on data. But, but if you train on a model, you can, you can perhaps handle things that, that you could foresee, but are kind of corner cases. Yeah, yeah it, it is a bit circular, indeed. Yeah, it's taking it to a, a higher level, but uh, not uh, stretching it to the sky, right? Yeah, yeah I agree. So, one more quick question. Yeah. No. Thank you. Um, so, that was a nice uh, talk. And I, I read your paper, and I really liked how you tried comparing self-driving cars with uh, autonomous plants. Um, so, I've been saying, I've been trying to do the same at different uh, venues over the last two years, and people have come back to me with uh, different types of questions. And in one setting, a graduate student uh, told me 16-year-olds can drive a car, 16-year-olds cannot operate a plant. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, it's going to be very difficult to bring that kind of autonomy into plants. How would you answer that question? And the second question is, I had also seen a lot of skepticism among colleagues uh, uh, when I talk about a higher level of automation. Um, and I think that's partly driven by the hype around AI and related topics. So how, how would you respond to them? I mean, and I think uh, uh, 
the, yeah, so this is the, the skepticism is, uh, sure. is widely present. I, I just wanted to hear your opinion on that. I mean, I think that's why this notion of levels, autonomy, levels of autonomy is actually quite useful. Because, I mean, you can debate uh, for all types of, uh, of industrial plants whether we will ever reach level five, right? But to, to discuss uh, and say, now we're at level one, we aim for level three, might, might be useful. Uh, but I agree with you, and, and it will, for us, it will for sure happen in these mobile applications much earlier. I mean, the mining companies want it. Uh, the uh, the uh, Norwegian uh, ferries across the fjords, they want it, no doubt. Right. Uh, and in the mine, it's within a fenced off area and everybody is security trained, right? It might actually happen much faster there than, than, I mean, I have my doubts that you will see on a broader scale self-driving cars in, in, uh, in the near future. We have seen uh, experiments, some failures, uh, but, uh, but will it happen everywhere? And what's the business case? I mean, some people actually like driving their car. Uh, so. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's tricky. Yeah. Okay, so please join me in thanking Alf again. And I'm sure Alf will stay behind if you have any other burning questions. Uh, yeah? Thank you again. <laughs>